Uh, we have the privilege to be joined by Karen Sillins of A Plus Career and Resume, who will be leading a tutorial on how to create a systematic networking strategy for, to facilitate your job career. I'm oh, sorry, your job search, career management, or business success. Karen Sillins is a multi-certified award-winning award-winning career and business coach, providing resume writing, career and executive coaching and business coaching to clients in Kansas City and throughout the U.S. and Canada. Karen held a member, ha, had held a membership in the prestigious Forbes Coaches Com Council since 2016 and was recently published several times in Forbes Online in 2020 and 2021. Was chosen as one of 38 career experts to watch in 2018 on Twitter and is currently rated as a top social media influencer on employment, human resources, and recruitment on Allegiance. She resides in Kansas City, Missouri with her husband, Andrew, and their four rescue dogs. Feel free to participate in the discussion by using the chat to add your comments and or questions. Karen will address your questions and comments following the presentation. Please keep your cameras turned off and microphones muted during the presentation just so uh, the focus stays on our presenter. There's a camera icon with a slash through it. You can click to stop video or start video, which is on the bottom left of your Zoom screen. There's a microphone icon that you can click to mute, turn off, or unmute, turn on your microphones, which is on the bottom left of Zoom. Thank you again for joining us, to, for joining us today. Karen, you may begin when, when you're ready. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, we have rescue dogs. No, they will not be joining us for the appointment, though I will say that uh, our last uh, time doing this uh, last month, there was one that was getting a little impatient, uh, and she she was do making a few sounds in the background, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll try to avoid that today. So networking is something no one really wants to do. Unless you are a social butterfly, and that is really only a small portion of the population, you don't want to network. Um, and it's because it seems like it's this formalized thing. It's this chore you must do and people write books about it and all this fancy information. But it really is very simple. It's developing a at least peripheral relationship with somebody. And it's quite simple in what it requires from you. Um, so I have some definitions there, but I like the first definition the best, which is why I put it first. And it talks about networking is making links from people we know to people they know. That's really important. A lot of people network and they think the person in front of me is going to be the end all be all to my future. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's somebody they know. And that's where a lot of times people get stuck. They forget that they're not just networking with a person in order to discover if they can hire them at their company or if they are an influencer for them in some way. Instead, a lot of times it's the people that they know, which are often 150, 200, 250 people that are in their circle that they could connect you with if they just had the right information about you and if you network in the right way. So the rest of that says in an organized way for a specific purpose. The purpose is to help them. I will tell you that it's not to help you because if you help them, you will ultimately get help from it. And so the last of it says, while remaining committed to doing our part, expecting nothing in return. And that is a very powerful statement and it's very true. Um, networking is never about you. And we'll talk about that in a minute. You should know that you're always networking. You're on the phone talking to somebody. You're online on LinkedIn and you're writing somebody uh, in anything uh, or you're posting on Facebook, which may just have horrified some people when they think, oh, I'm networking then. Oh, I should stop posting that. If you think that, yes, you should. Um, but it's also going to the grocery store or actually attending some sort of event. It could be if you're able to in your area to go to church or if you're attending church via Facebook, synagogue, temple, whatever it may be. And sometimes it's just having a Zoom meeting with somebody um, and that can be a lovely way to network. Networking is a normal part of our life whether we realize it or not. Have you ever stood in line at the grocery store and somehow a conversation has been struck up with the person next to you or on an elevator? or in the doctor's office. Congratulations, you've been networking. 
Have you ever gone to a party and spoken to somebody that you don't really know? Congratulations, you were networking. You just didn't realize it. So if we stop looking at it as this whole formal process, of, I must do this and there's my A, B, and C and all of that, you're gonna make your networking a lot more effective. It should just be conversations. That's what it's about. So what's the first rule of networking? Networking isn't about you. I had a person say to me one time in a seminar, I go and network on a regular basis with people. And I go to these functions with the specific purpose of building my business and getting more business and nothing happens. And I said, that's why your networking is not working. And they kind of looked at me with that aneurysm look. But as I explained to them, you're going with a purpose for you. You need to go with a purpose for them. If you help others, you will in return get help. Think karma. <laughs> um, it's kind of like the golden rule, do unto others. Well, I'm going to help them in any way that I can. That may come back to me. And it will. It may not be immediate, but it will come back to you. It's all about you spending the time to learn about other people. One of the things that uh, an author wrote in a book that I read years and years ago is that everybody's a book. They have a story. Open the book, get a little bit of the story. And that's where you want to go first. So we want to establish networking objectives. And I think the first objective we establish is that before we ever engage in that conversation, whether it's at the grocery store, at a party, or at an actual event, that we do so in a way that's not about us. It's difficult to convince people that networking needs to be about other people sometimes, but it takes so much of the pressure off when you think that you're trying to help them. Now, I am not shy. My husband's not shy. There's no shy going on here. Look at the hair, the hair's red. There's no shy, but that's not usual. So I will interrupt somebody at the grocery store and offer a tip. <laughs> I will do that. Most people are like, uh, maybe not. But guess what? In all the years I've been doing this for people, I've not had bad reactions that I can remember. Or somebody was like, who are you? Uh, no, I've not gotten that. Instead, I'm trying to help them. And while sometimes they may initially be like, well, who's this person talking to me? They're not unwilling to hear what I have to say. I get it. You say, okay, well, I'm not an expert in career. So what can I offer them? You have all kinds of expertise and lots of other things that I do not. And I think about a lot of the different jobs that are out there that people hold. Um, if you're in the medical profession, if you're in IT, if you're in finance, if you are in what I do, if you are anything related to that, if you're in human resources, uh, people just have all kinds of questions for you. The IT person can naturally just fix my computer problems for me. Um, the medical person can, oh, answer all my medical questions. That kind of stuff actually is an entry point for people like you. But you also have knowledge that doesn't have anything to do with a career that sometimes can be shared with people because you hear them talking about how they can't get ketchup out of their kids' jeans at the supermarket. And you have a great solution and it's all natural and you share it with them. That's also networking because you offered them a valuable piece of information. They may want to return the favor. The impact of COVID has been most incredible. Not just from the fact that we switched so much stuff to Zoom and we're doing so much work from home, but also that we have masks on. Masks eliminate a lot of our ability to read people's facial features. See their eyes, but we don't know for sure if they're smiling or what's going on behind that mask. And that can be kind of disconcerting to you. Well, we still have to reach out. We're still gonna occasionally have a conversation with somebody at the grocery store. It's just gonna be six feet apart. And yes, they're gonna have a mask on, but you can have that conversation. And I do it, I just did it last week, didn't hurt anything. Nobody looked at me bad. Nobody ran me out of the grocery store. It's not going to hurt you. It's just that normal day-to-day -day stuff. So COVID creates certain impacts, but I don't allow my clients to use it as an excuse not to network. Some of them will, 
but we have discussions about it. Developing your own system is not just about planning whether I'm going to do any networking. It's also about keeping contact information. One of the things that people do is they go and they meet somebody, but they don't get any information from them. And this is especially profound when it comes to an actual networking meeting or you're getting information from somebody on LinkedIn or whatever, but you don't write down the name, you don't write down when you talk to them, all that kind of stuff. And we will talk about that. How effective is networking? Well, it's part of the hidden job market. But the hidden job market is not as hidden as we think it is. People know about jobs that are out there that are not going to be advertised online. Every company will not just go, I can't wait to spend money to advertise my job all over ZipRecruiter, Indeed, and you know whatever else I can find. Not necessarily, especially when they have a lot of jobs, many of them may only be housed on the website in their website. So their own database of the jobs from the HRIS system that you can go in there and look. That's a lot of jobs that are available that people just don't know about. I would actually challenge you if you're in a job hunt right now from that standpoint, you know, or you're uh, a business owner and you're trying to help somebody or whatever, or your friend, family friend or whatever, target certain companies. Don't just go, mm, I'm just going to rely on Indeed and I'm going to do a search on one thing and have them magically send me jobs. No, go into the company websites of the companies you most want to work for and spend some time in there every week for just a little bit. Seeing what's new, seeing what they've got out there. And it will also give you a lot of times some information about that company. How much are they hiring? How much interest would they have potentially if you're a business owner as you know, being their consultant? Do they have a position for this? Or are they hiring for that? Could I insert myself potentially as a consultant there? So there's a lot of different applications that you can use this for if you'll just spend the time doing it. Next is many jobs, since they're not advertised externally in traditional venues, some people just hear about them. So I, I get that. I get people that are contacting me internally from companies, and I just had one uh, two weeks ago. They're looking for an administrative assistant. It's specific to the construction industry, and they need to have certain knowledge. And it's a decent paying job. It's not, you know, ooh, we think you, you should do all of our office work and get paid $9 an hour. That's not this job. And you need to have some understanding of that arena. Well, they reached out to me to see if I had anybody. And the one person I had, they're missing a couple of elements that they really want. But it's still a job that's out there. Now, whether they've hired yet for it, I don't know. I know they were already starting to do interviews. But I find out about them. You may have somebody who you're talking to, their spouse came home or their significant other or a parent or whomever and said, hey, I've, I've heard about this job at XYZ company. You didn't even know it existed. It didn't show up in your Indeed search or on Career Builder, but it's still out there. And there's a lot of jobs that recruiters actually advertise on LinkedIn that you won't hear about. So if they're not going to put them in the traditional venues or they're gonna do it by all word of mouth and some companies won't even post it on their website, it is truly word of mouth. And I can think of two companies in particular that do that here in town. Why are you just going to rely on one method? Another thing is your ability to garner a position or at least get an interview goes up a ton when you have a connection within the organization. And that's not going to happen for every job. It's not going to happen for every consultancy gig or, you know, you're trying to sell your, your widget to somebody. It's not going to happen for everything. But there are those times when you, if you'd done a little bit of extra work there, would have found that connection that could have helped you. And I have had clients, many a client, who because they made that connection, they got referred to, oh, now I'm working for the Kauffman Foundation. Now I'm working for this. Now I'm working for that. Well, that's kind of a big deal. They would not have gotten that interview automatically without that connection. Networking is a lot of different things. So people think, oh, well, it always has to be in person. No, that can be online. LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, anything you're doing online can have that application to it. But 
you also want to know what you need to say. And we're going to talk about that. The other thing is the internet factor in this. Sometimes you'll actually see, say, a job fair instead of it being the traditional job fair where you go to a hotel or wherever they're holding it and you go and visit booths. It's a virtual job fair. Now you're actually almost like texting with somebody. You're doing instant messaging. A couple of things I want to tell you about there that you want to be real careful about. Or if you are trading emails or instant messaging with somebody who maybe as a business owner, you're looking at having a business relationship with. Spell check, spell check, and spell check again. Read it, read it, read it, then send it. Because I had somebody tell me the other day, well, I was amazed at this person. They were typing so fast and they were texting with people or they were, I think it was instant messaging with people. But, you know, there were some spelling errors in it. Well, if they've taken just a second to read it, I type fast too. Um, if they've taken a second to read it, some of those errors wouldn't have been in there. And sometimes those errors are really unfortunate. Um, we tend to see them on, you know, like the talk shows at night where they do the funny segment of the unfortunate ads that people put in papers and things that they put on social media. And we go, oh, I can't believe they did that. That's what happens when you don't read your stuff. So the internet factor is both wonderful because now we have all this video that's normal to us now. We may not like it, but it's normal to us. Um, we have all of the different social media venues. We have the abilities through email that we've had you know, for 20 plus years now. But you also have the potential to create issues because you weren't minding the store and making sure what you were sending out was quality. So the first thing we're really gonna talk about as far as in details, cultivate your people skills. Don't know what to say. It's easy. So people go, oh, I can't, I can't meet people. I can't go up and just talk to somebody. If you're at a networking event, and this includes stuff that's online, you're going to see people hanging out, but not engaging. Whether this is online and they're kind of in the periphery there, or it's actually at the event and they're standing on the outskirts. They got their drink in hand with a horrified look on their face like, my boss made me come. What am I doing here? Most of them have that look on their face like, if I could run, I would. Those can be some of the most perfect people to approach. I call them the Frady cats. And we're going to talk about the different types here. But Frady cats are not unable to speak with you. They'll actually engage with you. They're just not going to come up to you and talk to you. And you may be one of those people. You may be saying, I don't want to go approach people and just walk up to them. My husband and I just go walk up to anybody. We don't care. We'll just go meet them. Most people are not like that. And that's okay. This is for especially a person like you. Don't make it hard. Just go near the person and go, wow, there's a lot more people than I thought would be here tonight. Or, oh, there's not as many people as I thought would be here today. You know, message one of these people and say, hey, if you notice people aren't really interacting a lot, whatever you have to do. Guess what? About 95% of the time, they're going to answer back. And usually it's friendly. It's something like, oh, I know, I can't believe this. It's not, but I do this to people all the time. I'll go gather them, gather Freddy cats, get like five of them, go to a table. It's a lot of fun. And now they have their own click, which is great. Um, but what happens is, is now they can talk to each other because you're not going to an event or you're not going to anything online either to meet 400 people. You're going to interact with four or five and that's it. Because you can't learn enough about people if you're trying to interact with a giant group. It's not going to be effective. So questions can start out by just trying to elicit a response. That generic statement, but it usually gets people to go, Oh, I know. I thought there'd be a whole lot more people here tonight. I'm kind of shocked by this. This is a heck of an event. You can also then introduce yourself and now start a conversation. Now you can ask questions that are even better. You know, well, what, what brought you here tonight? You know, tell me more about what you do. Have you worked on any interesting projects that, you know, recently? Or if they're unemployed, oh, how long have you been hunting? These kinds of things get you some information so maybe you can help them. But you also combine that with the fact that you're listening to them. You're asking questions, but you're listening. Listening makes people feel valued. 
and they want to keep talking to you. And now they start asking you questions. Now, let's say you're still thinking, if I'm going to go to an event, even if it's online, I ain't doing it by myself. I hook clients up to go to events and it's hilarious. They get a new friend a lot of times. They've never met this person before, but this person is more on the lines of my husband and I. And we'll just go introduce them to people. <laughs> um, you need that. And, and I'm not talking about outlandish. I don't mean, you know, show up, act strange, you know, want people to throw you out. This is, they're a partner in this. And this, this could even be a spouse or a significant other. They're just going with you. They are more willing to go introduce themselves and create a conversation. That can work too. Don't ignore the fact that sometimes it's good for other people to get out and do the same thing or be online and do the same thing because those interactions can be very rich for you in information because maybe you initially won't be involved as much in the conversation, but you will as time goes on. Networking only becomes more natural to you with practice. A lot of you are very well practiced. You just don't even realize it. You will talk to people in an elevator. You will talk up to people in the grocery store. You don't think a thing of it. You're sitting there talking to the person who's checking you out the whole time. Guess what? You've had the practice. You just need to apply it in a little different way. So let's talk about the 10 type of networkers. Six of the 10 are people that we try to avoid and you are not gonna see all of them at any given event. So don't go, oh, I can't go to an event because I don't wanna deal with all these people. No, this is not totally a thing that you'll see at every event. And you may actually run into none of these. I've had events I've gone to, haven't run into one of these people. But the first group on this is the clicks. So I've got them from, you know, number five through 10. The clicks are like being in high school with the kids who you couldn't approach their group. You know, they were fabulous and they were, you know, doing their hair or whatever. And you couldn't approach them. And if you did, they just look at you. And every school has the cliques, no matter how small they are, unless it's like two person school, there's a clique someplace. And those cliques become problematic because they don't let other people in that clique. Don't bother with it. And you'll see them, they'll be at the events a lot of times and they'll be having like these personalized conversations with people. They just came from work with them or they known them for years. They're not networking, okay? They're in their clique. And you can't insert yourself into that clique. And if you try, they're just going to look at you weird. So just avoid them. And I joke, you know, they're flipping their hair and they're eating the cheese and they're drinking the wine and they're laughing. Like people know who they are and people have no idea. Next are the egomaniacs. You've ever heard the song, I can do anything better than you? That's the egomaniac. You introduce yourself to them. You start finding out some stuff about them. They start asking some stuff about you. And whatever you say, they can do it better. Their dog can do it better. Their car can do it better. Their spouse can do it better, whatever. Here's how you get out of that. Once you figure out that that's indeed what's going on, do not be afraid to do the following. I am so glad I've met you. Do you have a business card we exchange? Or can I get some information? Perhaps we can connect on LinkedIn. But I just noticed somebody in the chat that, oh my gosh, I haven't talked to them in years. Or I am so sorry, I just spilled something all over my table. I have to go clean that up. However, you have to get out. I tell people who are really shy, you will to get away from some of these people. Literally go introduce yourself to a stranger. You're like, I am going to go across the room and do it just to be done with this. So you, you have to extricate yourself from the situation in some way, shape, or form. But you can do it really politely. And it doesn't mean you can't have any connection with that person, you're just not going to sit and talk to them anymore. Next, vampires. Vampires will suck the life out of you. Their life sucks. Their job search sucks. Their business sucks. Everything sucks. <laughs> okay. That is who these people are. You're not going to help them. Okay. All they're going to do is suck the life out of you. So if you notice one of these people uh, is in your conversation well, I have really enjoyed meeting with you. Do you have a business card? Or can I get your contact information? We should connect on LinkedIn. Grab it, leave. <laughs> That's how you do it. You do not need to stay in these conversations. There are other people you can go talk to. Know-it-alls. Doesn't matter what the subject is. And this isn't Ducky from the show NCIS or Spencer Reed from Criminal Minds who 
kind of do know a lot about almost everything. Um, but these are people who just think they do. They give people terrible advice. They're just, they're, they're a hot mess walking around. We don't need to be involved in that. And the great thing is that they love to do is they love to be an expert in your area of expertise. And you're going, that is not even remotely correct. Don't get into that conversation. It's not, you're not going to win. I have so enjoyed meeting you. Do you have a business card? Can I get your contact information? Next are naysayers. Naysayers, you're trying to help them. So you're talking to them about, well, have you tried applying through this or have you tried this strategy? Or, you know, I, I built my business partially. You know, people thought because I have the website and da 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 it's more legitimate or whatever. No matter what, they've tried it once, it didn't work. <laughs> and whatever you tell them, they have tried it once, it did not work. If you're the presenter for something, you can actually kind of talk to them and stand over them and get them to stop um, in a gentle way. You can't do that in a networking event. It's not going to do you any good to try. No matter what, they've tried it. It doesn't work. So again, can I get your contact information? I see somebody I know across the room or in the chat room. I just need to talk to them. And lastly, are takers. They are only interested in what they can get from you. I don't see them as much in traditional networking events as I see them in job fairs. Oh my gosh, they're all over the job fairs sometimes. And they will, you'll have resources for people just to look things up. And they'll go, can I take this? No, it's just a book to share information with people. So you can take the title down and everything. The library's got it. You know, I know Joko's got it. Mick cotton has got it. Well, I really want this book. Well, it's my book. <laughs> and my husband, who's sitting across the room, can tell you he's seen this before, too. You have to tell them they cannot have this stuff. And it's not fair that I give you the sheet of paper I have in front of me when nobody else got it. Um, you know, I'm, it's for information. Or you're like, hey, take a picture of it. Take a picture of it with your phone. You can have that. Some people just want to take, though. I remember I used to take an entire portfolio of samples to job fairs. I don't do job fairs too much anymore. But when I did, I would give examples literally from my samples. And what would happen is every once in a while somebody would come up and go, can I take pictures of all your samples? And invariably, the person that they were with would go, really? No. Um, what are you thinking? But that's a taker. I am so glad I met you. Can I get your LinkedIn information? We should connect. There you go. You're out. So now let's talk about the four positive ones and why when you can spend time with them, this is not a bad thing. First are the master networkers. This is like snipe hunting. There really is a snipe. It is a bird. And you do not go out in the middle of the night hunting for it, banging on pots and pans. This is what we do to kids who are camping for the first time. <laughs> and we just tell them they're going to go on a snipe hunt. Um, it's, it's funny and all of that, but it's not really how you find one. Well, this is the same with the master networkers. Snipes are not common, a common bird. You don't see them very often. And then there's parts of the country you don't see them at all. A master networker will come into an event and you'll see them. They'll walk in and everybody in the networking event knows who they are. Well, now do this. Boom. <laughs> they are all over this person because they have a certain gift that is just amazing. These are the type of people, and I met Dr. Wayne Dyer once. He was one of these people. When he's talking to you or when he was talking to you, because he's passed, you were the only person in the world that mattered at that moment. There are some people who can do that, and it just amazes me that they can have that much power in that moment to really create that relationship and you'll know it when you see them you can try to get to them and there's no reason not to other than time constraints uh, and but if you get to talk to them you get that feeling that they don't give anything about what's going on around you at the time they care about talking to you next are the frady cats and we have talked about them these are perfect people to engage with. The whole reason that these people are there is because somebody's told them they need to network. It could have been their boss. It could just be they know they've been told, hey, as a job seeker or as a business owner, you really need to do some networking. The problem becomes as a Frady cat that they're 
just not going to go up and engage with other people. And this isn't always shyness. Sometimes they're just more of an introvert and they're more comfortable with somebody starting a conversation with them. And that's okay too. So that's where you saddle up near them and make a comment or, you know, you click on a couple people in the chat and say, Hey, I notice a bunch of people aren't interacting. Does anybody, you know, have anything they want? Let's introduce each other or something, you know, we'll be amazed at people that will respond because they were just waiting to be engaged. Card dispensers. I love card dispensers. They will immediately come up to you. And the minute they meet you, they're giving you their card. Uh, even in the age of COVID, <laughs> um, you see this on LinkedIn, particularly if you're a business owner, uh, they will immediately want to sell you something. They send you their information, click on this link and see my video and all this stuff. And you're like, oh, gee, not again. Um, but that's what they do. These are great people to say, interesting, when you're in an event live, interesting, tell me more about what you do. And if you can see them, you will watch their jaw drop on the floor because most people just take their card like, yeah, okay. Um, they're actually shocked somebody's taken the time to know them better. And actually, most of these people do have a pretty good network. They just have not gotten away from being a card dispenser. So we're trying to help them get over that. And you should not feel the need if you've got a business card or you've written your uh, contact information on something that you know you're giving to people that you have to just immediately do this or immediately get their email to send it to them you know some people these days at networking events what they're doing is they have it all on their phone ready to go to send you an email which is a great idea for you just get it into something that you can send to them immediately but having said that um getting that conversation gives you a reason to send it now you know i want to continue engaging with this person I want to continue this conversation maybe afterwards, have a phone conversation with them, connect with them on LinkedIn. The only way you're going to do that is if you know enough about them to know, yes, I want this to continue. Because some of the people that were on the more negative side of the networking uh, frame, not so much. <laughs> you're like, yeah, I might invite you. I might not. Lastly are the Klingons. These are the people who think you're their sister or your brother from another mother. They are clingy, but not in a creepy stalker sort of way. They just really like you and they will be happy to help you. Go collect some Klingons. They're great to collect too. And they often know a bunch of people and they're not bad people. They're not, they're seriously not going to creep you out. They just, they found somebody they really liked and boom, there you are. You know, if there's another redhead or a fake redhead in the crowd at some event, half the time they're in my purview at some point going, hey, you know, let's meet. Um, it's funny how people will connect with certain things. Um, I love clothes and jewelry. My husband's probably about to roll his eyes right now over there. But I, I love girly stuff. I'm a girly girl. That's why you see rings and pretty glasses that match my outfit and all that kind of stuff. Well, there are people who really hook into that, men and women, and boom, they're right there. And now you're their brother or your sister from another mother, and that's okay. Take advantage of that. Unless for some reason there's something off about them, and I have had that only rarely happen, um, you want to continue this talk. And you'll see them at other events then, and now you guys can go collect some more people to talk to. It's really a very valuable relationship that can go on ongoing. I have several people. I see them at different events. Sometimes they're on this. Sometimes they're on another thing. They are just wonderful. And suddenly you get an email or a LinkedIn message from them or they, they message you through Facebook. And they're, oh, my gosh, I'm so happy I saw you. You know, all that kind of stuff. That's another conversation, people. Seriously. Oh, how's it going? Oh, well, what's going on in your life? How's the family? Da, 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 da. That's networking, too. Oftentimes you haven't seen them for a while. Just like people that you're trying to re-engage with that you've not seen for the last year because of you know COVID, you can re-engage with them by starting a conversation, just asking how they're doing. How is everything treating you? How is your family? Are you working from home? You know, all that kind of stuff. Nothing wrong with asking those questions. And that's what I'm challenging a lot of my clients to do right now is re-engage with one or two people a week. So that's not too stressful but one or two people a week that they haven't talked to in a while. 
not 10 years, but you know, a year or two. If you remember these types of people, you won't think, oh, because they're kind of clingy, I, I don't want to deal with that. You'll be like, oh no, this is a person I can definitely continue to talk with. But when you see the people that are a little bit of a warning sign, <laughs> you can go, I, I have so enjoyed meeting you and off you go. And it's so funny, you know, I always wonder, has there ever been a time when I've given this seminar, and I've given this seminar a lot, um, has there ever been a time when somebody's been at a networking event with me and they've seen me do that and, you know, now they're giggling? Um, but truly, it does work. And every once in a while, there actually is somebody across the room I do want to see. Um, so how to make a contact. We need to keep our contacts in kind of three buckets, okay? People we really know. Family, friends, oftentimes neighbors. Um, if you belong to a religious institution or a volunteer group, you oftentimes know those people pretty well. Those are in the first bucket. Every one of those should know you have a business. Every one of those should know if you're job seeking, period. And it doesn't mean you just walk right up to them and go, oh, I am looking for a job and I need a job, you know, help me. No, it's having a little conversation. And when they ask about how you're doing, you say, well, you know, I, I I'm, of course, hunting for a job right now during COVID. It's that conversation that gets you more information to them. They're going to start asking more questions to you. You ask more questions to them about how their life's going. Again, not about you. And people will go, well, if you're leaving the networking conversation because you're you know, not particularly fond of this person, that's, that's being about you. you know, that's being practical. <laughs> you want to spend your time with people who you can help. You can't help them next people you need to reconnect with which we were just talking about now in this group there can be people you haven't seen in five or ten years when I went to my high school reunion uh not too long ago I had not been to the they had one at five years I'm like really <laughs> and then they had one at ten and they were in venues I had zero interest in going to and at times when I really couldn't go then they had the 20 year, and for some reason they couldn't find me even though I was in the same house. Um, and then for the 30 year, I got barraged with stuff and I definitely went and it was just a load of fun. But I've reconnected with a bunch of those people. So now I do on occasion, hey, how's it going? You know, I've got a couple of people that I, you know, I call friends from Facebook. They're going through cancer treatments. And, you know, I, I do check in to see how they're doing and I do, yeah, as a Christian, I pray for them um, because you feel terrible that they're they're having to deal with this. I don't see them on a regular basis, but I do have that connection through that. You want to keep those kinds of things going. And those people you need to reconnect with that you went to high school with, you went to college with, you were in the sorority or fraternity with, you, you know, worked with five years ago, 10 years ago, you'll find them on LinkedIn or you'll find them on Facebook. And your first conversation to them is not, hey, I'm looking for a job or I'm, I own my own business now. Your first thing with them is, how are you? It's been so long since we've talked. That's your first connection. Next, people you will meet along the way. So these are the strangers. We don't know them, but we're going to get to know them if we both decide we have interest in doing that. These people run the gamut. They run the gamut in age, in whether they're rural or city or socioeconomic status or whatever, it doesn't matter. We don't care about their race. We don't care about their sexual orientation. We don't care about any of that. We're just meeting a person. Treat a person like a human. Stop worrying about all the other stuff that we spend time dividing each other about um, and needs to stop. This is a human being in front of you. Get to know them. Open the book, read a little bit, <laughs> okay? Learn some, some of their story. Most people that you know actually know about 250 other people well enough to have had a conversation with them to know if they might be able to help you. People go, well, they don't remember that. You'll be surprised at what people remember. Uh, it's dependent upon the amount of connection and how often they have that connection. Or if you've given them enough information when they hear something from that person that they haven't seen their plumber in a year and their plumber's at their house and the plumber says something, they're like, I know somebody you should be talking to. 
I do this all the time. It's a very good thing to do. And networking can sometimes be about nothing to do with your job, nothing to do with anything that has a business relationship. It's, oh, you need this. Well, here's where I went to get that. And I will tell you, their prices are fabulous. That kind of stuff. Or, hey, I use this service professional and I would recommend you give them a call and talk to them. We're getting some work done on a portion of our house that's, you know, kind of, it, it's getting a little rough. <laughs> and we got that particular contact through our neighbor across the street, whom we have already seen the work they've done on their house. And we're like, these people know their stuff. It can happen as simple as that. And these people turned out to be a blessing because there's all kind of metal work on this particular thing that my father and my grandfather did. And I watched them do it because we own my parents' house. Um, that I watched them do when I was about six years old. I don't want to lose that. It just happens to be that these people can do the metal work and save everything and make it all bright and new for me. That's pretty cool. In person, yes, this is still done. People go, oh, I can't network in person. Grocery store, <laughs> Home Depot, <laughs> you, know, you go places, even the doctor's office. Now, obviously, we're, we're, we're definitely distanced very much at the doctor's office because we don't know what they have, but we still can have that connection. We can still talk. There's nothing in the rule book that says you cannot talk to people, okay? Phone. And I highly recommend if you can't do in person, you engage in phone and video. And a lot of people are like, I don't like video. Then do the phone. And some people just refuse to do the video or they don't have the technology really bandwidth to do the video, whether they're in a very, very rural area or they're just like, no, I, I don't have a computer. I have my phone and whatever. Okay. But at least you can still talk to them. And they still know a bunch of people, whether they'll admit it or not. Email. One of the best things about email and sometimes your use of social media when it's private messaging is to be able to tell people more about what you do. Job titles, not real descriptive. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. We have to be very careful to just not label ourselves with a job title. And women, I'm putting this out there for you or anybody who suffers from a confidence issue has the imposter syndrome going on. You are not just in anything. I never walk up to people and go, well, I'm just a resume writer and a career coach. Oh, heck no. I market people for a living. That's what I do. And I help people figure out what they're going to do for a second actor when they grow up. You know, that's what I do. Instead of, oh, well, I'm just this or I'm just that. And I'm particularly talking to stay-at-home dads, stay-at-home moms. That is the biggest group I will get. Well, I'm just this. No, you're not just that. You are not going to sit there and tell people you're a domestic goddess. Please don't do that on a resume. And I've seen that several times um, over the years. Instead, you're going to tell them what you're doing. You're raising your children. You're involved in the PTO. You're doing all these different things with the kids at their activities and things. Time to go back to work. They're heavily involved in school, that kind of stuff. Not, I'm just a this. Avoid that language. And if you catch yourself doing it, stop and rephrase. Tell people why you're calling. If it's a video, you've set it up ahead of time. So they know. If you're sending an email, tell them why you're sending that email. So this is where descriptions come in as far as what you really do and why you're calling them. So calls can be really interesting because sometimes when you finally get a hold of somebody, whether it's via their voicemail or it's actually them in person, and you're trying to remind them of who you are, this is where, where you write down where I met this person, you know, what their name is, if, you, if they don't have a business card or if you're doing something online, when, where, what their contact information is. If you don't have a date and you can't tell them where you met them, then they may not remember you. But if you say, I met you at this venue three weeks ago at this event, oh, and maybe you wore, you know, some outfit that was more noticeable. You had something that they keyed in on. You remind them of that. 
Now, guess what? Your networking just went up here because they recognize who you are and they'll talk to you now. If they think that you're some kind of you know, telemarketer, they're not going to want to talk to you. So give them a reason. We definitely want to say, hey, here's why we're calling. You know, we had talked about potentially meeting for lunch or, you know, having a little Zoom chat. And I was just calling to schedule that because, you know, our networking does not work if we're not going to follow up with it, which usually gets them to say yes. If you want to discuss openings related to your area of expertise or at companies they might know, this is now a place to do it. You've already had that initial meet and greet. You've learned a little bit about them. They've learned a little bit about you. If we haven't really talked about opportunities and stuff yet, this is the time when you can actually ask them the question. Instead of just waiting and going, I'm not going to do that. No, 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 no. You can ask them the question and say, hey, you know, since I'm looking in this area, uh, do you have any contacts that you know of that I could potentially, you know, phone, email, you know, whatever. You'd be surprised how many people will give you people's names, give you their phone number, and they'll say the following, tell them I told you to call. or I'm going to email them first, or I'm going to call them first, and then I'm going to email you back. That's what you're looking for. And then if they've really helped you, how about writing a little thank you note? People go, well, you know, we're sending things by email today. That may very well be, and I'm not saying that that can't be appropriate right now with COVID, but we're also sent, still sending things by mail. Um, think about how much stuff we get delivered to our door. Uh, we constantly have stuff coming to our door. Informational interviews are also a form of networking. So now somebody's introduced you to somebody else who wants to talk to you. Chances are this has an informational concept to it. It's not necessarily they're interviewing you for a job and may not have a job at that moment. But they wanna learn more about you. That's an informational interview. What you're also doing is learning more about them. Tell me how you got into this work. What do you like most about it? What do you like least about it? Sometimes those are the most informative questions you can ask. It's a great time to get in front of decision makers who may not have an ability to make a decision at that moment, but may down the road, or they can influence somebody else who is a decision maker. In online, the Zoom go-to meeting and Teams and all the other stuff that's available for people to use out there these days is really valuable. There is something about seeing a person's face that makes a difference. If I was just talking and you couldn't see me at all, there would be a disconnect. And it doesn't mean that nobody can listen. But this is a lot of listening. <laughs> I'm talking a lot. So there's a lot of listening going on here. It's more impactful when you can see a person on the other end even if you're in and out of that conversation because the kids are in the dogs and whatever you still feel more interactive i highly encourage you if you have not embraced on occasion doing a zoom call or go to web or go to meeting or whatever you got out there webex do it it will pay huge dividends for you and people will make every excuse in the book not to do this sometimes, and there's no reason for it. Social networking. So the big four are LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Here's my biggest warning to you. Keep it professional. You think, oh, they can't see my stuff. So let me give you a little lesson. If you know a few little back ways in, I can see your entire Facebook profile, whether you're private or not. And my husband can come over here and tell you right now how many people I have horrified by them seeing me watch their profile and go, oh, yeah, here's your kids doing this and here's they're going that. And, it, and there's some HR people that know this little trick, too. People go, well, I want you to teach me that trick. I'm not teaching it to you. But what I am going to tell you is there are people who know it and will use it. So be careful what you say. I am not concerned whether you say you like Biden or you like Trump, you like Jesus, you like Buddha, you like Muhammad. I'm not concerned about those things. It's when you're dogging other people who don't believe this, you do. That's bad. Okay. It's it's not appropriate. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it. 
freedom of speech comes with responsibility. And what will happen is these companies will decide not to be responsible for you as an employee or not to use your business. And that cannot be a good thing. That's just not a good thing. Doesn't mean you can't have opinions, but I have political opinions. I share them direct to people. I don't sit there and post all this stuff online. I certainly have opinions on religion. I'm a Christian. I don't sit there and go, let me push all my stuff on you. I'm not going to thump you over the head with the Bible, okay? You can say certain things, positive stuff, you know, nice stuff. But please, please, please do not dog people who not, do not believe as you, okay? That is not appropriate. And if your Twitter has a privacy thing on it, that creates all kinds of questions. What are they tweeting and who are they tweeting with? You want to get discontinued from a job search real quick? Your social media will do it very fast. And I know an organization I was just helping who had two great candidates. They talked to them on the phone. They were so excited about meeting them. They got into their social media and that was the end of it. Perfectly good job, gone for these two people. Not even a possibility because they didn't know better. So if you want to take that chance, go ahead. But you will pay for it. And your family and friends will pay for it, too, because that's one of the ways that they judge you is based on who you're linked with. So you may have some friends and family who you have to disconnect with for a while. I use a couple of my family members as examples of what not to do when I'm showing people in person things. Um, but beyond that, you know, there's people that I have muted and all kinds of stuff because they just. You know, they can't help themselves. And people even in my industry who know better, we've had the discussion and they're like, I need to show my kid. No, you don't. You don't. You need to be responsible and show your clients what they're supposed to be doing. Um, blogs. If you're going to blog, please make it a professional blog. Nobody needs to know about your bathroom habits, what you do in the shower, any of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and I don't mind some cute things like this is my doggy blog, you know, or my weight loss blog as long as you're not getting too graphic. I don't mind that kind of stuff. But then again, there is that issue depending upon who can access it. Will they question what you're gonna do when you get to the company? Or will they question you as a business owner um, and working with you maybe in a, in a corporate manner? So there's still that we have to be careful. If I'm saying something negative about corporate America, I'm about to back it up. <laughs> and I'm going to get percentages and I'm going to tell where it comes from. I just did this big one on HR just like three months ago. And people are like, oh, you had all kinds of facts and figures and stuff in there and surveys and everything. Yes, because people just give all kinds of numbers all the time. And this is what it is out there. And they have no backup. It's their opinion. When I have an opinion, I'll go, my opinion is. <laughs> and I don't have a problem with that. But I'm also writing from an area of expertise. I'm writing about careers and business and jobs and interviewing and all of that. I am not writing about things I don't need to be writing. Email, keep it professional. Now here's the thing with email, instant messenger, and I'm gonna have instant messenger slash texting. You wanna talk about people getting their panties in a wad about something you said to them and you didn't mean it in any bad way. Try email, try texting, try whatever. Um, whether it's autocorrect, which can have some unfortunate problems with it at times. I've seen some hilarious things. Or it's just a take it right. But you didn't mean it in any bad way. Be very careful how you're communicating, particularly with recruiters and internal HR and hiring managers and people you're networking with. If you're a business owner and you're communicating with, say, the CEO and the purchasing agent, you know, all of this needs to be professional. Just like your work interactions need to be professional. If you want to go out afterwards and have a beer and talk about other stuff, go for it. But at work, it's professional. And well, my husband still works in corporate America. He sees some really questionable things sometimes. <laughs> and he's like, this is not right. Um, so don't don't be that person and it gets people fired and i've had clients fired for this stuff they came to me and they're like how do i explain this in an interview so it's it it's out there it really happens and if you can keep things on a more professional level not allow yourself to get your you know all upset 
and be careful what you're putting in it, in your communications, you will have a lot more success. Online discussion groups. Oh, I can't even begin to tell you about online discussion groups. People want to talk about things that have nothing to do with anything. It's kind of like being on the company meeting and the meeting should have taken, oh, about 20 minutes to get everything done, but we're still on an hour later. <laughs> and I bet you there are people nodding their head on the other end right now going, oh yeah, oh my gosh. Um, every once in a while, I get to hear some of this from the other end and it's a riot because People want to talk about things that have nothing to do with anything. And a little bit of that is because we're so isolated from COVID. So you allow a certain amount of that. It's okay. But there's also wasting time, giving lots of personal opinions, getting all upset about things because you think somebody meant one, meant one thing and didn't mean it. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. And if there's something that you really feel the need to comment on on social media, Maybe give it 24 hours. Kind of like making a purchase. You want to make a major purchase. You probably shouldn't just be making a spot decision on that. You should be thinking for 24 hours because in 24 hours, you may not care anymore. Um, same with this kind of stuff. You know what? Now that I've thought about it, maybe I really don't need to respond to that. It will save you a whole lot of grief. Where do you network? Well, there's a whole lot of opportunity out there. And the first place I tell people is go to your Kansas City Business Journal or your local business journal for your metropolitan area. Because there are sometimes people on here from other parts of the country. There are business journals pretty much for the top 100 cities. The traditional Kansas City Business Journal type thing um, is for the top 40 cities. But there are business journals for like Springfield, <laughs> You know, that's not top 40 city um, by population, but they still have a business journal. One of the things you'll notice in the business journals for your local area is at the end of it, and they usually come out every Friday, and the library has them, and then there's access, and the library offers you free access. I can't begin to tell you what that probably costs them to get that for you, so please use that. <laughs> get a library card, get access, because at the end of every one of them, is a list of events that are coming up. Whether you have to pay, if they're online, if they're in person, um, if there's a dinner involved, all these different things. So now you know a whole lot of stuff that's going on in town that other people just don't know about. These business journals are so rich with information because all they're covering is business in the general area. The Kansas City Star, for instance, has to cover culture, sports, world news, national news, blah, 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 blah. The business journal covers your business in the greater area all the time. So that's why they're ahead of the game in a lot of stuff. Networking with your family, friends, and neighbors. Now, if you have an Uncle Fred and an Aunt June, and Uncle Fred can't understand why you can't keep a job for 45 years like he did, don't tell Uncle Fred. Everybody else you can talk to about it, okay? They should know what you do. That is such a huge thing. People don't know what you do. Telling them you're an IT tech doesn't mean anything to them. If I tell people I'm a resume writer and a career coach, they still don't know what I do. My husband's a financial operations analyst. How many people out there really know what that is? I'm going to guarantee you not most of you. <laughs> so we need to give real information so people can help us. Give them a little description of what you do. The companies that you're targeting or company types and other maybe related job titles. That helps them because we can't just go and hunt for just a job title. Go ahead, type in salesperson into Indeed and just, you know, for Kansas City and watch your brain explode. You know, no, you need to give them account executive and you need to give them, you know, sales professional and you need to give them, um, you know, lots of different the sales coordinator, all kinds of things. Give them these different terms so they understand the different things that you might be hunting for. It's gonna make your life easier and they can give you better information. And that's what we're going for. Same goes for people who you know at your house of worship, current coworkers you trust. Now, if your company's downsizing a bunch of people, then it's open season on everybody there as far as I'm concerned because everybody knows you're leaving anyway. Yeah. I've got three months and I'm out of here. Go ahead and talk to every coworker. 
but be careful the coworkers you talk to if everybody doesn't know because I have had some horror stories from clients before when uh, they come back and say oh my gosh <laughs> um, that's how I lost my job this coworker told everybody and I didn't think they would former employers and coworkers can be very valuable and a lot of times write you some really nice reference letters or agree to be a reference for you networking groups and organizations there's a whole list of stuff on here job clubs i'm going to tell you one thing about job clubs if the person running the job club is the only person giving you the information you need to go to a different job club okay i have spoken at a lot of job clubs and those job clubs the differentiation from them from others that it's just this one person who supposedly has answers to all i don't know is they bring in recruiters, they bring in people who are placement specialists, they bring in people who are HR directors, they bring in people who do what I do, they bring in people who are life coaches, they bring in people, they bring in lots of different people to talk about different areas of expertise for the people in the job club. That's why you're at the job club to get all that information. And then they also have, oh, you know, we got, you know, about these jobs and this company's letting us know they're hiring and all that kind of stuff. But the job club should have speakers. And I, I just did one not too long ago. I did one for one that was Zoom. Not a big deal. So please be cognizant of that. There's all kinds of different people on this list. Alumni, people you rely on, and they rely on networking. I'm really going to hit on that one. Realtors, plumbers, hairdressers, you name it. There's a whole list there, and there's a bunch more that can go on in that list. These are people who rely on a network for their next job. In my business, a certain amount of my clients come through referral. I have three, four clients right now out of my total client set. It came from a referral of a referral of a referral of different people who've used me over the years. In one case, I've, this whole family, I'm, I've got, now I've got a cousin. Now, so I've, I've worked with the mom and both daughters and the aunt and you name it. Referrals are like fine gold, <laughs> okay? You don't, you don't find that every day and you want to take advantage of it. Cold calls are the one thing I'm going to warn you about on here that you want to be really careful with. If you're going to cold call a company, the whole reason you're cold calling them is because you have seen an ad and you're trying to develop a relationship. That doesn't go over so well today. And a lot of companies, you just they're not going to talk to you. You need to find out if there's somebody there that you can really talk to. Then you can have a quote unquote cold call, which becomes a warm call. Okay. But just walking into places and stuff, usually not a good idea, especially in the age of COVID. So, what do you need? You need your resume and cover letter. Well, I don't think I really need a cover letter. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> okay. 69%. This read, I tweeted it. It's, it's on my Twitter, it's on LinkedIn. Um, you can find it somewhere in my, my feeds. 69% of people who are hiring will read your cover letter because they don't want to just see what you write on your resume a lot of times. And these are people who are higher up. This is not the initial 15 second look. But the scanning system may actually get some information off of it. That is true. But when we're actually getting to the person who's making decisions about who's going to get a call or who's going to get hired, they will read a cover letter a lot of times to see how you communicate in a more marketable way. Your resume is kind of like your fact-based, here's my marketing brochure. Um, your cover letter is like a marketing letter. So it's more personal. It's where you use personal pronouns. You, know, you can say, I, my, we, them, they, their. Cover letters need to be part of this. Sometimes people will put together an introduction or a networking letter. That's fine too. And what I call a networking letter is like a combination of the resume and cover letter. There's a lot of bullet points and, you know, it's a one pager. That's where your one page comes from. Networking business cards. It's important that you actually have these. As we come out of COVID, more and more in-person events will start to happen again. You do not want to be without a card to hand somebody and don't use your current company card. It looks so bad to use your current company's stuff to hunt for a job. So instead, please create your own business cards, which you can do at home and do them like 10 or 20 at a time and not have to worry about it. And if you need to change things, you can change things. If you go to 
these other places like Vistaprint or FedEx Kinko's or whatever, it's not that they won't do a nice job. They'll do a beautiful job. But you can't make any changes now. Okay. And if you get the freebie on Vistaprint, guess what? It's going to say on the back of it, Vistaprint. So unless you want to advertise Vistaprint, I would worry more about advertising you. Job target. You may have more than one, which means you may have a couple of business cards. And that's okay. Your proficiencies. Think big three or four. So let's go back to sales for a moment. If I'm going to have as a generic title across the top of what you do as a sales professional, underneath that, one of the words is probably going to be business development. Okay? That's a big buzzword in, in sales, business development. They like it when you bring them new stuff, um, whether it's from existing clients or new clients. But maybe you're also somebody who, as a salesperson, does do a lot of marketing. And a lot of it has surround social media, social media marketing. There you go. Uh, and then maybe a third one, CRM, which means customer relationship management. It's a software. And particularly if you're an ace at Salesforce, that's the big one that everybody wants. Then you can put Salesforce CRM, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, right away, they can see, oh, look what they can do for me. And there's bunches of other key, you know, account management, relationship management, negotiation, blah, 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 blah. And guess what you can put on the back? Some of those other big keywords. Phone number, home or cell. A lot of people still have a landline. It's like everybody only has a cell phone. That's not true. A lot of people have a landline. I have a landline because I need a dependable source of phone for dealing with clients whose cell phones regularly cut out and shut off and do all kinds of crazy things. My phone does not do that. Okay. And that's why some people keep landlines because it doesn't do that. Or, oh, I have to call 911 and my power's out. So I can still do that. I have to go run and get my cell phone. Email addresses. Please, please, please make them professional. Okay. I don't mind that you have your, you know, here kitty at whatever. You can have that for something that's not for work or business. And try not to give away your age with your, you know, I'm going to put the, you know, my year of birth or whatever. No, don't do that. Just put something that sounds normal on it. Put your name, put, you know, get a Gmail. Um, you know, if you've got Microsoft Outlook, that's really going to work well. Now, here's the thing. I have an AOL. I send all my stuff. I have a bunch of emails, except Gmail. Gmail plays nice with no one. I send all my stuff to one email a day. I send it to my AOL because it has a rock and file cabinet that you will not believe and search ability in it that is just amazing for my whopping $4.99 a month. And yes, it still says you've got mail when you sign on. But I have Karen at Career and Resume and Info at Career and Resume and Contact at Career and Resume and I have my Gmail and you know, all that kind of stuff. So I have everything except, again, for Gmail flowing into that. So I only check one a day. It doesn't make me any less professional. And in fact, three millennials in the last year have signed up for AOL because they could see what it did, it did because they could see what I was doing with it. And they're like, oh, I can't do any of this with Gmail. So think about that. Um, this is important. My Gmail does not say something goofy on it. Neither does my AOL or any of my other things. Whether it's Karen Sillins at Gmail or it is a plus career at AOL.com, it still looks professional. Set aside a separate email if you have to. Make it your business name, make it your name name, whatever you got to do. And people will go, well, you know, I can't really get my name name on Gmail. Everybody's got one there. Okay, that's fine. Well, then put the last four digits of your phone number or something there. They don't necessarily know what that is unless they're really thinking at the time. But at least with that, you're not creating questions. Because I seriously saw one one time that had the letter C, M, Y, N, P, P, L, R, N, G. That is C, my nipple ring. Okay. And they had that on a resume at a job fair. Okay. There's a whole bunch of people laughing right now. That really happened. It will continue to happen. I see people bring me there and I'm like, really? You have a bad word in the middle of your email address. Um, and they sometimes don't even know it. You need to really consider what you're using as your email address because it will get you 
out of consideration for that job. Um, next, LinkedIn address. You can personalize your URL on LinkedIn and you need to. Your LinkedIn address should not be linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Karen underscore Sillins with 45 numbers and letters after it. It should be forward slash Karen Sillins or Karen M. Sillins or Karen Russell Sillins or whatever, but have it be something that makes sense. And if you have a wonderful certification like a PMP or something like that, that you can you know, advertise a little bit with it, and you're like, ah, eh, somebody's already got my name, put the PMP with your name. It's okay. Because what you're doing is you're kind of advertising you have that certification, but you've got your name overall, and you'll be surprised how many of you can actually get your name, period, without a problem. No middle initial, no nothing. Because a lot of people don't know how to do it. When you go to LinkedIn, on the front page of your profile, profile, not on page, profile, there'll be a section over on the right-hand side across from where your picture is. If you don't have a picture, put the picture on there, okay? Um, smile, a lot of angry people on LinkedIn. So um, put your cursor over there where it says, get a personalized URL and change how your information appears or whatever. Click on that. You'll see where you can change your URL out and test and see what they have available. Pick one, be happy, put it on your business card. Who answers your phone? A lot of angry answering of phones. So some people, cell phones, they don't answer them. Stop that. <laughs> I get that you're not necessarily going to answer it at the time, but check your messages. Okay. Companies will leave you messages. And I've had many a client lose out on a, a thing. And I've told them, you know, no, 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 no. A call comes in. You need to be taking it or you need to be listening to the message. And they don't. And it's a week and a half. And by then it's gone. If you're one of those people, stop it. <laughs> it's a bad practice. Okay. So listen to your messages. Some of them are a total waste of time. I get it. There's telemarketers and all that kind of stuff. Delete that message. Most of the time, they don't leave one anyway. But sometimes it's the person that answers your phone. Your child answers your phone. Not during a job search. Nope. I love kids. I'm not going to let them answer the phone during a job search. I'm not going to let them answer my business phone. Okay unless they are old enough to understand how to answer it and how to take a message. And teenagers, especially teenage boys, will not take messages. Okay? <laughs> they, just they think about it and then they go, no. The other thing is sometimes a spouse, significant other, a parent answers the phone and they don't answer in a happy and wonderful way. And I can tell a spouse or a significant other, a parent that, and they kind of have to listen to me because that paying me uh, but these people may not want to hear that from you so ban them from the phone i have had more i will call somebody about something their spouse answers the phone they'll be like hello <laughs> and you're thinking oh my god that's really bad and what if i was a company and i guess they're expecting telemarketer i'm go, hey jamie how are you doing oh karen you know it's like a whole different person now is on the phone no don't let it don't let that be you if you can't answer your phone nicely, then maybe just let it go to voicemail and listen to the message. Never leave home without your business cards. I give them out at the grocery store, gave them out one time. I had a needle in my arm giving blood. Here's my business card. Uh, Pal Gardens, Home Depot, you name it, pretty much anywhere I've been, I've given out one. On the back, again, you can also put that qualification summary or you can put your other keywords and key phrases. The back of a card is not used a lot of times. And so what you can do is when you're handing it to somebody, again, COVID isn't going to be forever. So we are going to get to go back in person at some point. You show them the card, you show them the back, all oh, there's stuff on the back too. Now I give you instructions overall of how to do this. In Microsoft Word, it's under your mailings menu. Okay. If you have an older one, there should still be one somewhere that says mail. And what you're doing is you're looking for the part that has the envelopes and labels. Click on labels, okay? You make them yourself. You can change things when you want to. You can just control the amount you make. You can save that for other things. Maybe you got a spouse hunting too or a significant other. You can do that. It's a wonderful thing. When you can control that and you make it look nice, why wouldn't you? 
Or if you've got a teenager who loves to do that kind of stuff, let them have at it and say, don't do anything crazy, but, you know, make it pretty. And they will make you a beautiful card a lot of times. And if you're hearing whining, that's the dog that likes to talk. All right. So next, meeting people, uh, learning names, repeat their names. There she goes. Her name's Honey. Uh, repeat their name and ask permission to use it. Can I use your first name? Can I call you whatever? And use their name in the conversation somewhere. It's how you'll remember it. As most of us, seriously, we hear the name and then we walk away and go, what was their name? You don't have to do that. You can learn the name. And the nice thing is if you're getting their contact information, now there's another connection there and that's good. Answering who you are and what you do. What do you say when people ask you what you do? Well, most people give a job title. That doesn't mean it can't be a part of your answer, but it shouldn't be your whole answer. You do not need a two minute pit. I don't know who started this thing. No one wants to hear it. Um, and when you have to do it in front of a bunch of people, it's like, let me tell you about myself. I like it. No. 10 seconds at the most. And usually it's just a short sentence. You need something that gets people's attention. Your expertise, theory, your skills, your accomplishments, the target audience, whatever it is. So when I tell people I market people and businesses for a living and I help people find out what they want to do when they grow up. What do you do? That's what you're looking for. And I give a couple of examples down here, which are, you know, Mary Kay, Avon, I help women look beautiful, whatever. And that's all good. The business coach, I help business owners get more clients than they can than they can imagine. But I'm a favorite, it's the IRS agent where he says, I'm a government fundraiser. But people then ask more. That's what you're trying to get. If you can garner that information from the different things that you've done that make you unique or can be a little funny, appropriately funny you can have a really nice little tagline, if you will. Something that you can say, that's not that two or three word answer. And God help you if you worked at Sprint and you got one of those titles over there, okay? I know it's T-Mobile now, but I'm sure they still have a lot of the same titles, which are I'm the engineer of you know the world for this company and da 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 and it's this really long title. They're not the only company that does it, but some people, they need to stop making job titles. They just, that's not, that's not where they need to be. Um, Remember, ultimately, this is about what makes you different from the competition. Competition of other job seekers, you're just in general career management, and you kind of setting yourself apart, you have your own business. What makes you unique? Okay. Cultivating your people skills and building rapport. This is where a lot of people struggle. They're like, I, I don't, I don't know what to say, and I don't know how to look and what I should do. Dress the part everyone okay if you are doing an online networking thing showing up in your bathrobe or putting a shirt on and having no pants on is a bad idea okay there should be no pot leaf in the back and that people see okay I, no <laughs> and i wrote this in an article recently and i got more comments that came back and through my emails from colleagues because they're like oh my god i tell my clients this all the time and they don't listen Actually, I find my clients really do, and their backgrounds are really good. You don't need to create a weird one. I just have a bookcase behind me, but nobody's going to go, oh, what the heck? You know, there's nothing weird sitting back here that people are going to go, yeah, it's like pottery and books. That's what's back here in a couple of games. That's what's back here. Instead of, oh, my God, what's in back? And when I do things from another area of the office, there's this pretty picture in the back. Again, not going to have a lot of questions from that. So make your background and how you dress something that people will not question. Now, for job search, sometimes when you're doing something, you don't need to be in necessarily a shirt and a tie, but you want to at least have a nice shirt on and maybe you know a jacket or something. It, it's going to look better, or you want that nice blouse on. You may have jeans on with it. I do right now. You have a nice blouse on, so it looks more professional. Jewelry's fine, you know, I like my sparkle, 
but it doesn't mean you have to have 4,000 pieces on. But seriously, I can put rings on my fingers and toes if I want to, but I don't need to. I just have a couple, three rings on and that's, that's as far as I go. Um, be careful, no giant earrings, no things that are gonna distract people. Another thing is for women, and if you're somebody that maybe is in an arena where it's appropriate as a male, or however you identify to wear some makeup, makeup, okay? Because I know a lot of makeup artists over the years, and some of them are men, and guess what? They're gonna put on a little makeup, and it's not going to be anything that's going to be um, hit your face, but they are going to make sure that they look um, very camera ready. Okay. It's okay to do that. For the average guy, my husband, and why any part of that, not going to ask him to, but he's definitely going to look like he washed his hair. He washed his beard. He's got one of those long beards. Now, you know, guys are growing those. Make sure it's neat. It's combed everything. Hair should be neat but it doesn't mean it can't be big or small. That has nothing to do with it. I have a client with dreadlocks. He is awesome looking. And I love his dreadlocks because they look so cool. And they're like this combination of dreadlocks and braids. Um, that's fine, but they look neat. He puts them back. He makes sure that that looks very neat for any, any networking or any interviewing he does. So it's not in his face and things. That's what we're talking about. So dress appropriately, smile lot of angry people out there and the masks are going to be removed at some point so whether you're on video and you can absolutely smile then or you're in person don't you want people to want to talk to you because they don't want to talk to somebody who doesn't look pleasant they just don't want to look, they don't want to look your way they don't, they're afraid you're mad at them and, you know, there's a lot of jokes that are out there about that right now, and I'm not going to go into them, but smiling is important and it makes a difference. And when people can see that from you, they want to talk to you. And some people are like, you know what? My teeth aren't the greatest. That's fine. I had a client like that. Smile with your mouth. You don't need to smile with your teeth. Personal agenda. Bye-bye. People buy from people they like. And they like you if you're listening to them and you're asking them questions so you can have a back and forth engagement. Don't ask about the job openings. Do more idle, more than idle small talk. This is not the time to only talk about the Chiefs, the Royals, a soccer team, the weather. Okay. Questions to ask. There's a lot of different things you can ask. One of the things you can really do is get into what do they do? Maybe they already have kind of a development of a thing. You know, I'm an IRS government fundraiser, you know, whatever. Maybe they have something like that going on, and that's going to be very helpful for you to kind of hear what they're saying. And ask questions to learn things. The things that you learn could mean you could help them. If most people don't know how to change the URL on their LinkedIn, and yet you do, guess where you just became an expert for them? If they don't realize how important it is to have a picture because that is visual, we are a visual society on their LinkedIn, you can talk to them about that and how they get one that's good without having to go pay a bunch of money for it. Be positive, use good body language. I talk with my hands, nobody cares. You can talk with your hands, that's fine. What we don't want is stuff that scares people, okay? Because some people, their body language, they're you know, like this and all that kind of, that's not positive. That's, that's how my mom looked when she's about to use my middle name as well. Karen Marie, get over here. You know, I was in trouble. Uh, that is not a positive body language, okay? And people love to get advice and give advice if done in a positive manner. But particularly, they like to help. So if you help them, they'll want to help you. Unless they're one of the takers or something, usually you're going to receive some sort of acknowledgement for helping them. And a lot of times that's, hey, I heard about this job. And it will come back to you at the most unexpected times. I get emails from people years later and they're like, you met me at da, 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 and you were so nice and you helped me with this. I heard about this and I thought you'd want to know about it. And it's not a sales thing. It's none of that. It's actually something that's quite useful. Leave them with a tip. A hint, a referral, or lead. Sorry, every time I do one of these, sometimes in the middle, uh, my lipstick starts peeling off. So here we go. Um, leave them with a tip, 
tip, pinch, referral, or lead. What I mean by that is if you don't have for them necessarily a referral to somebody, that's okay. But if you can tell them how to get ketchup out of their kids' jeans, that's good too. Or they're new to town and they don't know a lot about where the best places to um, go for a certain sandwich or because they love barbecue or whatever, and you can make several recommendations because we got so many here in town. Um, you can be helpful to them and you can explain why you like one over another and all that kind of stuff. And that would be interesting to them. I did that with somebody at a conference not that long ago. They were fascinated. It was all about the barbecue for them. By the way, they went to Jack Stack so they could have the beans. That was their whole thing. They wanted those beans. Not a vegetarian, but they really wanted to try the beans. Ask the person to be a part of your network. That way, they don't turn down the LinkedIn invite when it comes to them, unless they were just absolutely lying to you. And mingle and network with several people. When you go to an event, whether it's online or it's in person, it should not be just about you standing with one person. I found somebody. Thank you, Lord. You know, and you're just going to stand there and talk to them. No, go and talk to some other people. Remember, four or five people. And there may be that one person that you're like, and they're a big no. <laughs> so you go find somebody else. Practice with friends. Practice asking questions. A lot of times you don't know as much as you think about your friend's job and stuff. It can be very insightful to learn more about them. Start slow and find that person standing alone in the crowd. And they can be standing alone online. Or they can be standing alone at an event. When to exchange business cards. I know the card dispensers come up to you. Boom, here's my card. Okay. We're still not going to rush it. Or take their hand and go, interesting, tell me more about what you did. Or maybe not, we're going to do the elbow thing. Tell me more about what you did. That's okay. But what we're doing is we're planning on probably giving them our business card later on. Right on the back of their business card. Or in a little notebook you take with you. Or into your phone. Any of that's appropriate. Where you met them. If you don't have their name, get their name. Get the spelling. Okay. You're not going to find them on LinkedIn if you have the wrong spelling. When you, Where you met them, when you met them, and when you're going to follow up with them. Because if you don't follow up, what's the use of the contact? Follow-up could be a LinkedIn connection, a Facebook connection. It could be you're going to call them. All of those are fine. Some of them will ask you for a resume. Email me your resume. Okay. End a good networking conversation with an eye towards follow-up. That's where you can do that. I don't want to take too much of your time. Perhaps we can continue this conversation. A lot of my clients wind up going to lunch with these people or for a coffee. And usually if somebody loves what they do and they have things to share with you, it's not a five-minute conversation. You're there for an hour. At an hour. Don't let a good contact with her away. And make sure you have a way to keep them. Because what will happen is you'll put it in your phone and then you don't check that again. No, that needs to go immediately to someplace on your computer so you can be reminded in a big email or whatever. Just like if you bring home a real card, don't just dash it on your desk so you never see it again. And just in case you had that one moment where you weren't thinking, at least when you pick it up three weeks later, you can turn it to the back and go, oh, that's where I met them. Because you won't remember who that person is most likely at that time. I prefer follow-up by phone. If you're going to truly follow up with somebody, do it by phone. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do video. But at least with phone, you're making a connection by voice. And don't bother the contact all the time. Follow up with them. Put it in their corner if you don't get them right away. Let them respond back if you don't hear back from them in a week. Follow up again. A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, I've got to follow up with them. And they're just not very good about getting back. Okay? And don't stalk them. <laughs> At one point, one time, well, they tell me they're going to get back with me. I want that, you know, and I'm like, no, that's called a stalker, um, which made them laugh. But they, they started getting the feeling for what I was telling them, because, yes, yeah, sometimes we're annoyed. It's like, dang it, just like the companies that ghost you. Any of you are job seekers out there. You've had that experience. If you applied for more than a couple of jobs. Oh, yeah, they phone interviewed me and then I never heard from them again. Um, or they never even acknowledge the receipt of your resume. That's called ghosting. And ghosting is rampant. And now they complain. 
I love this. The complaint is job seekers know them. They don't come to the interviews or they don't show up for the first day of work. <laughs> Karma. Uh, what should you expect from follow-up? Well, if they're following up with you, you need to be respectful enough and follow up back. Um, even if it's one of the people you don't necessarily want to talk to, at least give them the courtesy of a little fallback. And they may or may not be as excited when you talk to them the next time. But a lot of people actually are, especially if it's a connection of a connection type of thing. Usually those people are much, much more likely to be sitting and talking to you. So what information do you need to get? Their name, their phone number, their email address if there's a comfort level, which will be on their business card if not. Um, what do they do? LinkedIn address. And unfortunately, a lot of people, because they don't have it personalized, you're just going to have to hope you find their picture or they have a picture. Keep track of all networking contacts. So besides the follow-up, don't stop networking because you find a job. This is a primary issue for people. They get a job and then they disappear off the face of the earth for a while. And then, oh, now I need help again. So suddenly they're in LinkedIn again, like they're all, oh, no, you should not. You should be on LinkedIn a couple days a week for a few minutes. Share an article. Let people see you're still there. And then it won't be weird if you have to come back to them later. If not, they'll be like, they only care about me when they need a job search. Uh, or they want to sell me something. From a database or social networking tools to the old school, I got a notebook. You have to be able to locate and utilize your contacts. They won't do you any good if you don't have that ability. Whether you stick them in Outlook, you have the old-fashioned notebook with cards glued in it. However you want to do it, it's all good. Or a combination of those. As long as you can get to them and you look at them. And lastly, if you don't have access to your contacts data, all that networking is in vain because how are you going to get in contact with them? You're going to have to try to see if you can't find them via uh, LinkedIn their name and you know how to spell it that creates a lot of problems and you don't want that networking contact to go away so what questions do we have thank you for all that excellent information karen uh we do uh have uh a few questions that have come up in the chat the first one is, talk about the benefits of having a video as part of your resume. So some people will do a video, particularly in sales, marketing. They're going to be doing presentations as, say, an instructor or something. It can be valuable from the standpoint of people kind of having that get to know you. But it should not be part of your resume. It's if the company wants it or you want to put that on LinkedIn for people to see. Because think about it, if you're going to have just your online career portfolio, if you if you will. LinkedIn serves that purpose. So if they connect with you now, they can see that video. Uh, or you can just make it so people can look at it if they want to. I mean, I have videos on there from NPR. Actually, that's a um, not a video, but it's just a uh, something you can hear, like a podcast type thing. But then I also have one that's from uh, one of the local news stations recently that I did. They can click on it. They can listen to it or they can see it. And I make that as public as it, they want to be. And on the new website I'm developing, which is my same website, it's just prettier now. Um, once I switch that all over, it'll have those videos on it and everything. So it, it's all about making sure that you don't just put that out there, but that you do give them enough that if they want to see something like that, you have it prepared. There's nothing like getting that request to create a video and you're like, I don't even know what to do. <sighs> now you can do some research, think about it, just put together like two minute, that kind of stuff would be ready for it. I saw a question pop up, how important is LinkedIn? Extremely. If you're not on there, companies will question it. And you do not have to be the person that's just spending inordinate amounts of time on LinkedIn. Go in, set up a complete profile, even if you don't put bullet points and stuff under your jobs, at least get, you know, the last 10, 15 years on there. Put your education on there. Be honest about stuff you put on there. Do your skills. Get a picture. Smile, please. Um, you know, with a nice background. Friends, family can take these a lot of times. Um, and, you know, make sure you're using appropriate titles and keywords and stuff throughout. 
that's as really hard as it has to be besides making some connections. And start with people you know. Do not fall for that. You must have 500 connections or you're never going to make it on LinkedIn. And there are places to tell people that here in town. I want to stop it. Um, no, we start with 30. 30, everybody goes, I do 30 people. 30 gets you where you want to go with getting more information, then 50, then 100, and you'll be shocked as to how quickly you'll get that. The other advantage of this is as you grow your network, you're going to grow with people that you don't know. If LinkedIn is only for people that you know, it's of no use to you. You have them in your phone or on your email list. You don't need that. But it should be a combination of people that you know and people that you're wanting to get to know. Use LinkedIn. It's very important. If they don't see it, they will question it. All right. Um, the next question is, do certain industries prefer more specific approaches? I don't know that they necessarily do. I mean, I would say certain companies have a preference to certain approaches. Like Cerner, they're very hands-off. Do not contact us. Do not come to our campus. It's secure. All that kind of stuff. You know, they're, they know. <laughs> But then and I'm not going to say what the company is, but I had another client, they were just able to walk in to these different companies and kind of meet somebody. And at a company you would not expect this from, they're like, oh, you, know, you have a degree. In, let us take you upstairs. You can talk to the hiring manager. <laughs> so it, it does on occasion wind up being that you can have that more personalized connection. But for the most part, unfortunately, the connections that you're getting are not what you hope as far as I wish the HR person would like get back to me when they said they would that kind of stuff instead what you're doing is you're trying to form some bonds maybe through LinkedIn through your networking contacts and people like that that can really get you in the back door and get you some people that will advocate for you all right uh, next question is what can you tell us about online video pre-interviews Companies are now requesting. There are a few questions you answer before they set up an interview. It seems to be replacing the phone interview. Yes. Um, two things about that. Number one, that's you against artificial intelligence. I am not a fan of this. And I just put a LinkedIn post out about this. Um, okay. If they're going to be that impersonal in your interview, that they can't interview you personally at all, and they got to do the AI stuff and text you and all that kind of stuff, you really want to work for them? That shows a lack of wanting to connect, in my opinion. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't support my clients when they want to participate in these, okay? But sometimes you have to sign a whole bunch of stuff, but they're not going to sign anything saying they're going to protect this you're not going to wind up on youtube um that they're doing their proper stuff on data storage and how they protect that and that they somebody can't get to your video and you know splice it onto youtube that's a little scary and some of my clients including a high level hr director have turned those down and said no if you cannot have the personalized contact, I will not participate. And the companies are just shocked. And some of these are big companies and they're like, oh, I can't believe you wouldn't do that. Well, you know what? You show me that you don't care. <laughs> so if you're like, I need a job, so I can't be that picky, I support that. If you say, for me, that's a bridge too far, I also support you in that. And the reason I go with either or is because it has to be situational to you, okay? and how you feel about it. And there are plenty of companies that won't do that. It's an unfortunate part of our culture right now that companies are getting lazy and they think AI is gonna tell them something. And the thing is you have no idea how many people are gonna be exposed to that video on the other end. They give you limited time a lot of times to answer the questions if you don't do it quick enough. And they ask dumb questions. That HR director, um, the reason she stopped doing them one of the video interviews had five questions and that's very common, you know, five, six questions. One of them was, what's your favorite dessert? Okay. She said, I must not have answered that right. And the other question that was questionable to me is what's your favorite movie quote? And I'm going to have to say for most of us, our movie quotes may not be things we can repeat on video. Um, a lot of us like the naughty 
quotes. So now we have to think of something like do or do not, there is no try, you know, we're repeating Yoda or something on it. Mm -hmm. That's not a good idea. And there, the, the putting people on spot like that means you have no idea what you're doing in interviewing. I train people in interviewing. I don't just work with client clients. I work with companies and I work with the people that are in the companies. And I have interviewed people before. I still interview people to this day. That's a bad thing. It's a very bad thing for them to play this game with people. So if you need a job really bad, you may have to put up with it. But if you don't and you can be picky, I don't know that I would. All right. Um, our next question is, what's the difference between a cover letter and an introduction letter? Introductory letters often come with something where, you know what? I don't know anybody here. I don't know if they have a job opening, but I'm really interested in this company and I've got this person's name <laughs> and they're a decision maker. So I'm going to write them and tell them of my interest. You'll see this a lot from younger people who you know, they really want to work for a company, say they're in the fashion industry and they're going to write a letter to somebody at a company, you know, Louis Del Olio, or they're going to write Donna Corrine or somebody like that. And they're going to write them hoping that it will get to their desk or they're going to write it to somebody else within the company. They, they know the HR person's name and they're going to put it through to them or whatever. Usually these are decision makers that are getting these, whereas a cover letter accompanies your resume. And it is that personalized version of here's why I'm qualified, but also I can't really talk about in definitive terms my ability to communicate. But if I can write to you in the traditional letter, I can show you I can really communicate. Why do I want this job? Because you can't put that in your resume. Why do I want this job? Why do I think I'm qualified? And why am I interested in your company? So that's the difference between the two. An introduction letter is just that. It's an intro. Hey, here's my resume. I, you know, I, I really like your organization. And you know, I just wanted to make a connection. The cover letter, you, there's a job there. Okay. All right. Um, next one is, what advice do you have for job seekers with extra challenges to networking, such as a speech impediment or being deaf or blind or visually impaired? So there's a lot of different technologies that are available today. And there's also the ability to use family and friends to help. Particularly when it comes to certain, it, it tends to not be as big of a problem from, because uh, I have a friend that's blind. Um, they have more success in doing this because they can hear the questions. It is so much more difficult when it's a deafness issue. And I have worked with clients from that perspective before and they have an automated machine. The big thing is to make sure that things are explained so the person on the other end has a comfort level. Because guess what? Companies are looking to do more diversity. And diversity is not just about race or sexual orientation. It's about more women, especially in the C-suite. It's about people who have disabilities who would be perfectly great workers for them. And they've just not considered this in the past when they should have. It's even small things that we don't think about like women with and men with children that they're, you know, they're the only parent or a pregnant woman. Uh, this kind of stuff, unfortunately, that kind of discrimination does happen. And companies are starting to have to go, we need to rethink how we do our hiring and not just make these choices like this. Well, sometimes it can be of advantage to say, okay, well, I do have this disability, but I can still work with you. We can still work together and let me show you how. Um, speech impediments? I've had a lot of clients over the years who've had a variety of speech impediments. I still encourage them to network. I still encourage them to interview because if they can communicate appropriately, whether it's stuttering, um, there are some things that happen to vocal cords sometimes that create a very different sound. A person may sound like they're older when they're very young, that kind of thing. You still need to talk. Your voice still needs to be heard. Um, but if you're going to a networking event or you're participating with one online, maybe have somebody with you who's also doing the same. It gives you a bigger comfort level and you still can communicate. 
and people go, well, I don't want to have to explain this every time to them that I have this vocal issue, then don't. You know, we, we are so obsessed with we have to explain things when a lot of times we can just go and do. It's understandable that if somebody's getting a record, you know, something that's um, an automated message that keeps coming to them because the deaf person is typing in their answers, that it might be a little bit more challenging and there's time in between and all that kind of stuff. But just because we have a speech impediment, that should not be the kind of impact that people allow it to be to them. Get out there, get a person with you. That'll help you feel more comfortable. And I've had a range of things that my clients have had over the years and they still can successfully network. All right. Um, one last question has come in. Um, can I discuss openings that I've seen at a contacts company, uh, but not specifically saying that I need a job, but just wanted to get information about uh, those openings? You can ask, um, particularly on LinkedIn, you can ask about it. Um, sometimes you can do it under the auspices of I'm doing this for a friend, uh, but companies aren't necessarily always going to give you more information. You know, they're going to just kind of say, here's our job, go apply if you want to. Now, if we have that real connection and we've really met the person and we're sitting with them at a lunch table, yeah, you can definitely ask. You can definitely ask because there's enough of a relationship now that's been built there's a comfort level, but just in general, people want to, you know, message through LinkedIn, things like that. These people don't know you. Chances are they're not going to answer. They're worried that there's going to be some sort of issue, you know, that they're going to be seen as favoritism or whatever. So they won't answer. It's the same reason that companies often won't answer the question. What did I do wrong in the interview? Why didn't you hire me? The thing that I often hear from my clients and from people at seminars is, well, I was perfect for that job. So were a hundred other people. And one of them got it. I'm sorry, <laughs> but that is the truth. And since there's a lot of people looking for only so many jobs, you always want to keep in mind that some of these companies, you're not going to be the fit that they saw or the job went away. And that's the other thing. 30% of what you apply for does not exist. Either they'll rip the requisition at some point during being online, you'll be applying for it and there's actually no job left there if taken it away. Two, they can't make a decision. They're looking for a unicorn. Unicorns don't exist. And I just um, shared, a. it was a LinkedIn post by Bridget Hyacinth yesterday. She's um, a colleague that's incredible. And she was talking about how she had a friend of hers who hires for a company interviewed 30 people and they couldn't find one. And she goes, you're the problem. <laughs> she just said, you're the problem. You know, you couldn't find, you, they're not qualified. No, you're looking for something that doesn't exist. And guess what? If they could find a unicorn, they could not afford the unicorn. So, and I, I see Patty online. Hello to Patty. I just had to say that I, Patty is a, a, a past client, so hello. Um, but I am very careful with people that they they understand that companies will not treat them right. And it's, hey, there she is. It's an unfortunate part of the job search. And now they get mad because the candidates are doing this back to them. I find a lot of irony in that. Um, but it, it is part of what you're gonna have to deal with. So. You know, will they tell you things? Sometimes they will. But the more of a relationship you have, the better that's going to go. You can get a lot more information from somebody who has a comfort level with you. All right. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us uh, here uh, today. Um, uh, Karen has provided a lot of excellent um, information. Um, be sure to go over to the Johnson County Library's website. Um, to our career and finance pages for other excellent uh, information. Um, and your local librarians are also excellent sources of information as well. Um, uh, so I'll, I want to be respectful of everyone's time and I'll uh, bid everyone uh, uh, goodbye. Um, 
Hi, everybody. Thank you for spending okay. almost two hours with me. <laughs> and I had somebody say this is a very good session, and thank you for making this available. Thank, thank you oh, all, too. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And excuse the dog that's whining in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing some more thanks coming in. Uh, yep, so people are... People are feeling good about the presentation. Good. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you for spending time with me. I appreciate that.